Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is near-death experience. My guest is Dr. Jeffrey Long, a radiation oncologist who is author of Evidence of the Afterlife, the Science of Near-Death Experience, as well as God and the Afterlife, the groundbreaking new evidence for God and near-death experience. He is the founder of the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. Once again, this interview was recorded in a hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada, where both of us were there to attend the Bigelow Institute Award Ceremony for their essay competition. And now, I'll switch over to that video. Welcome, Jeff. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the opportunity. You have set up an interesting organization called the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, and you've been collecting data on thousands of near-death experiencers. You're absolutely right. Over 20 years ago, I established the website mainly because I was curious. I wanted to see from my own personal interest are near-death experiences real? So we set up that website and immediately had a detailed questionnaire so that people would not only share a narrative of their near-death experiences, but also answer a lot of questions. And uh, you're right, over the greater than 20 years that we've been doing that, we're now over 3,500 near-death experiences that we have collected and posted back on the website anonymously, largest publicly accessible collection of near-death experiences anywhere. Would you say you learned anything surprising? <laughs> yes. Uh, I was amazed. I mean, I was aware of near-death experiences. I knew very little when I set up the website. Mm -hmm. You could say I was a skeptic. I, it was so unearthly, I literally couldn't believe it, even after having read some of the good research that was going on in the in around, that was circa early 1980s. Mm -hmm. So I, in doing that website, really wanted to learn for myself with the best evidence available, which are the first person accounts from people that actually had near-death experiences, so I could resolve that to myself. And very quickly, as they started flowing in all those years ago, I learned very quickly that near-death experiences are, in a word, real. A lot of times the uh, thinking is not so much that they're not real, but that they're not what they purport to be. The people that share the near-death experiences come from all walks of life. Physicians, scientists, homemakers, people of all religious backgrounds, and, and the a-religious. So these are all people that are going to share their experience with the website we post it anonymously, so it's not like they have any recognition from this. We don't pay anybody anything. So there's really no incentive for them to uh, either diminish or embellish what they're sharing with us. And it's a basic scientific principle that what's real is consistently observed. So by the time you get 3,500 near-death experiences and beyond that, and you see that remarkable consistency in the elements, that's the deeper characteristics, you have to really accept that that's a part of the greater reality, what they're, what they're saying. And your background is in medicine. I'm a, my medical background is radiation oncology, the use of radiation to treat cancer. Mm -hmm. So I've now been doing that for over 35 years and uh, so almost by accident over 20 years ago started doing this. But since I started my research on near-death experience, it's been literally a labor of love, if you will, my second full-time job. So <laughs> it's been a lot of fun, informative, and extremely inspirational to do that kind of research and then have the opportunity to share it with people around the world. Were you drawn to it through any personal experiences of your own? Yeah, I first heard about near-death experience completely by accident as I was decades ago in my residency training in radiation oncology, I was looking up a cancer-related article in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So as I was flipping through the pages, totally by accident, 
there was an article with the title near-death experience in it. And I never heard about it before, and it didn't make sense. I mean, you're either dead or you're not dead. What's this near-death stuff? Mm -hmm. So fascinated, I read the article and was immediately struck by, uh, here was Dr. Sabom, cardiologist in Georgia, uh, wrote about uh, many, many people that had cardiac arrest, their heart stopped, and yet here they are vividly describing very lucid conscious memories vividly and accurately describing ongoing events while they were, by all clinical appearances, completely dead. So I was so amazed, I read some of the references and remember thinking prophetically, gee, why aren't more people doing research on this fascinating topic? So that, that piqued my interest. A couple of years later, I had a college friend visiting me. I was in Iowa at that time. And just completely accidentally, while we were having dinner, our uh, the wife of my friend mentioned that she had so many medical allergies that she was undergoing surgery, had one of her bad allergic reactions and coded. And she said it kind of funny though, my physician instinct was, mm, I think there's more to the story here. So I pursued it and said, after thinking about this being the dumbest question I could ever ask, I mean, she was under anesthesia and her heart stopped, but I finally got up nerve because I was just too curious. I said, well, did something happen? while you were under anesthesia and your heart stopped. And she said, why yes? And described to me the first in-person near-death experience I'd ever heard. Very detailed, very dramatic, and she had no idea what that experience was. And I was able to help her with that. But again, from that moment on, I said, I've got to know for sure. If this is, really happens, just like she described, there's no medical explanation at all. And there's something bigger going on in this universe than I was aware of. You use the phrase coded. I know that is, is a medical phrase, but for our lay listeners, what does coded actually mean? Yeah, code means your heart stops. So the medical scenario is heart stops, patient heart attack, if you will, is a common uh, generic phrase for it. And then in the hospital, they call, a, you know, typically a code blue or some other type of code alerting the resuscitation team and others to come to the, very urgently to try to resuscitate the patient. And when a person's heart stops, that means that her blood isn't going into the brain. Jeffrey, you're absolutely right. The moment the heart stops beating, of course, immediately blood stops flowing to the brain. 10 to 20 seconds after that happens, the EEG electroencephalogram, now that's a measure of brain electrical activity. 10 to 20 seconds after your heart stops ble uh, beating, it goes totally flat. There is no measurable brain electrical activity. And yet by the hundreds, we have reports of near-death experiences occurring exactly under those circumstances. So that might cause uh, some people to think that maybe consciousness isn't related to the electrical activity of the brain as has normally been thought. I couldn't agree more. That's one of the many lines of evidence, one of the major ones, that consciousness, that consciousness that separates from the body during a near-death experience, typically going above the body, uh, is absolutely not related to physical brain function. I mean, it can't be. When near-death experiences happen and consciousness rises above the body, they're hearing and seeing ongoing earthly events about half the time, uh, in which the overwhelming majority of time, when they come back and check it out, it's accurate down to the finest detail. So here they are, fully functioning, if not consciousness, if not supernormal consciousness, and yet there's their physical body, coded, heart stop beating, clinically dead by indications of lack of vital organ function. And the intriguing thing is they do report a perspective, like yeah. hovering above the body, uh, and yet uh, and perceiving things, hearing, seeing, and yet without eyes or ears. Absolutely. Their physical body is down there. Their point of perception is up here. In fact, we have scores of near-death experiences, if not hundreds, where that point of conscious reference is not just above the physical body, but it can move to areas geographically far from the physical body. I mean like outside of the house, outside of the hospital room, outside of the operating room, far from any possible physical sensory awareness. And yet what they're seeing and hearing far from their physical body, when they check it out later, almost invariably accurate down to the finest uh, details. We actually interviewed a gentleman who, you know, once again, coded, heart stopped during an operation. For example, consciousness left the operating room theater and went down to the hospital cafeteria. 
where his family was having a meal, unaware of his life-threatening crisis in the operating room far away. When he came back and, and told them exactly what they were doing, exactly what they were saying, as you would expect, absolutely accurate down to the finest detail. Well, the intriguing thing to me, and maybe you have some insight into this, is that oftentimes a person will be coded, they'll have cardiac arrest, but they won't be able to report a near-death experience. That is absolutely correct. Only about 10 to 20 percent of those people that have that close brush with death have a near-death experience. Now, I co-authored a scholarly book chapter in the Handbook of Near-Death Experience that looked at 30 years of research. With me and my co-authors, we couldn't, in our review of the research, we couldn't find anything that would predict who would or would not have a near-death experience when they nearly died, nor could we predict the content of the near-death experience based on any demographic information. I mean, you name it, gender, age, pre-existing belief, religion, lack of religion, Nothing in prior research gave that prediction at all. So I was stumped about this, and that's, that's you know, fascinating why most people don't have a near-death experience. But I think sort of, if you will, the Rosetta Stone of explanation of that came in a near-death experience that was shared with me several years ago. In it, this individual was having, as so typically is reported, a near-death experience, just an overwhelming sense of peace, love, emotions that are off the scale, unknown on Earth because they're so vivid and dramatic. That's, that's common in near-death experiences. This near-death experiencer was actually interacting with what she firmly believed was God. And because she was feeling so overwhelmingly at peace, love, and literally at home in this unearthly realm, she asked God directly, why me? Why am I so special that this should happen to me? And God's response was, love falls on everyone equally. This is what you needed to live your earthly life. So to the best of my understanding, that may well explain why some people have near-death experiences and some don't. And I, I've, neither me or other researchers in the field have a better explanation. It's sort of mysterious. Another feature of the experience, I gather, since I've never had... Okay, thank I, goodness. <laughs> thankfully, I, well, I, you know, I'd say thankfully, but when I hear the amazing experiences, you, you kind of want to have it. <laughs> I, that I, could under, I, would, I wish we could have an experience, a near-death experience, without being near death. That would be wonderful, but... But I know people are often told they have a choice. They can return back to their body. It may be a body racked with pain and illness, or, or they can remain in this heavenly realm. Right. Out of the thousands of near-death experiences I've studied, the significant majority simply return to their body involuntarily. They may be told, it's not your time, you have more to do, and boom, they go back. But a significant minority do indeed have a choice. They're often with other spiritual beings. There's often a great deal of dialogue going on. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. For those having the near-death experience, and again, they're typically in an unearthly realm as they wrestle with that decision, that choice about returning to their earthly body or not, even though everything the near-death experiencer knew before, friends, family, loved one, their entire life on earth, even with all that, in consideration, the great majority of people having a near-death experience do not want to go back to their body. They want to stay in that unearthly realm because of that tremendous sense of peace, love, belonging. They, they feel deeply that that's the real home and they don't want to leave. And so it's, and often there's a very vigorous dialogue with other beings there as the near-death experiencer argues at times, uh, forcefully at times, that they don't want to be return. But often when that ultimately, when that decision is made and they do ultimately decide to be returned, uh, boom, when they recover from that close brush with death, they can share their near-death experience. But it's always impressed me just uh, as a vivid reminder, just how, how wonderful, how spectacular that unearthly, if you will, afterlife realm would be that, that they would be so willing to what, literally be apart from their friends, family, and loved one. And that's, by the way, that's difficult for spouses, for their loved ones, to understand that when they come back, when they hear that account. I mean, you were willing not to come back and return here. And all I can say is that's the general choice of people having a near-death experience. It shows how engaging, how encompassing, how 
uh, compelling it, it is to stay in that, in that afterlife. So that's actually the norm that people want to stay there and not return to Earth. And I gather that a small percentage of these experiencers, though, have a, an uncomfortable experience of the afterlife, sometimes even, one might say, hellish. Now, in my over 3,500 near-death experiences, I've looked very carefully for true hellish near-death experiences. They're very rare. Uh, I have a, in the, maybe around 22 of them uh, with a fairly high bar of evidentiality. Part of the problem in studying hellish near-death experiences, they're rare. Mm -hmm. They're compounded by other experiences that are not near-death experiences. For example, car wreck. They then have a hellish experience, but right at the time that experience is ending, they're waking up two weeks later in the intensive care unit. That is almost certainly intensive care unit delirium, just simply an effect of the brain dealing with the, the recovery from that close brush with death and the environment of the intensive care unit. Fairly common occurrence, uh, ICU, delirium, and not a near-death experience. And there's, uh, however, if you, if you look carefully at the, at the experiences that are truly hellish in, in near-death experience, they come in sort of two flavors, if you will, for my investigation. One is that you see the hellish realm, if you will, remotely. I mean, they're often with another spiritual being and they see a sort of a segregated apart area in that unearthly realm and they know or can sense or both or are told, you don't want to go there. That's, that's the, that realm. The other approximate half of the group I've studied actually are there and actually are experiencing a hellish realm. The most scary experiences I've ever heard are not in fiction books or in movies, but in some of the graphic description of hell from near-death experiencers. I, it is hellish in every sense of the word. Uh, however, there's a silver lining to that dark cloud of the hellish realm. First of all, many of them, they find that if they ask to leave, they may pray, they may just simply uh, seek to leave, and they leave. And so I think it seems to be like it's a choice to be there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when people have even these hellish experiences, they very often come back and will realize later that they needed to have an experience so vividly uncomfortable to allow them to confront in their own life issues of, of anger, guilt, uh, negative emotions that they are able to better confront because of that experience and they live their lives better. They may actually feel that that hellish experience, while it sounds awful and it is, was actually in the long run a gift. It helped them to be a better person and as they will admit, they needed that kick in the tail and there wasn't any other way they were going to really come to think about things and grow like that. I think me and, and other near-death experience researchers I'm aware of do not believe that there is a permanent involuntary hell. We are far more convinced with the dominant uh, attribute infusion of love throughout the afterlife. My best guess as to why hellish near-death near experiences occur, why there is that realm, is that there are beings who, through probably a series of very poor decisions, ultimately decide to be with others like them, unloving, angry, hateful, and ultimately end up in a segregated area of the afterlife in that hellish realm. Paradoxically, since they're, well, they want to be there, they, they chose to be there by their uh, angry, evil intent, to them that's their heaven because that's where they feel the most comfortable. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the afterlife, you're generally known immediately for who you are and everything you are, so you can imagine how uncomfortable that would be for somebody who retains that angry, vengeful, belief system in the afterlife. Another silver lining about hellish realms in near-death experiences is that is an extremely precise uh, line of evidence that even in the afterlife we all have a choice. And some people even, just like in Earth, have the ability in the afterlife to make choices that ultimately result in them being in that uh, hellish realm. Now, I've heard it said that what the near-death experience is revealing to us is, are the early stages of the afterlife. And I wonder if you have any sense from the people who report to you about, you know, some of the later stages. Okay. That's great. That's some of the deeper wisdom of near-death experience research. And not a lot of people know about that. So it's my honor and privilege to talk about that perspective and what I've seen. 
as amazing as these near-death experiences are, these unearthly, if you will, heavenly realms, uh, they may hear music that is beautiful beyond anything they knew on earth. They may see plants with colors that are beautiful beyond any experience or description possible on earth. I mean, this is literally uh, you know, paradise times a thousand. And yet, over and over in near-death experiences, even while they're in this a realm of overwhelming bliss, they may see over a fence, across a chasm, uh, beyond a creek in a forest, they may see an even brighter light and may have a sense that there's something even greater, even beyond what they're at now. And uh, over and over, I think this is sort of as far as people can experience the afterlife. I think that as, as amazing, as glorious as it is, those near-death experiences, and they're not unusual, lead me to think that there is indeed that realm even beyond that is so beyond anything we could imagine in, in our earthly life, even in a near-death experience, that uh, it's a hint that it's, it's glorious and it's wonderful, but it, probably beyond e anything we could imagine or even comprehend if we experienced it. I uh, practiced uh, back when I lived in California as a clinical psychologist and have dealt with a few people who have had near-death experiences. And, and what I discovered was that it's not always easy for them to reintegrate. Oh, that's true. I mean, just imagine, here you are, you have that life-threatening event. These people nearly die or actually do clinically die. So here they are while they're trying to recover from often some serious accident or illness, and yet they've had this amazing near-death experience. It's almost certainly something they didn't think could ever happen to them. They're often exposed to unearthly concepts beyond anything they could have imagined. I mean, over and over we use the word unearthly, but, but that's significant. That means it's not part of or even conceivable in their prior earthly life. And yet that's so much a part of the near-death experience. So here they are aware that there's an afterlife, even if they didn't believe in it. Uh, here they are may have encountered deceased loved ones. These are joyous reunions. Even deceased pets may appear in this uh, earthly room. So all of this, and, and, and they, a near-death experience, even though in earthly life they may have been unconscious or clinically dead for minutes, in, in the afterlife, in near-death experience, they almost always say time is either radically different or more commonly doesn't even exist at all. So there may be a profound amount of experience that would be hours in our earthly time in this heavenly realm. And they've had so much, so much to think about, so much apart from their earthly pain and misery. I mean, it's a lot to, to conceptualize and radically different from what they ever thought could occur. So boom, now they're back in their earthly body. They have to recover from that accident or illness that nearly killed them. They have to integrate many of these newfound concepts, the importance of love, uh, the concept that we're all connected and unified. I mean, you go from not believing how important that is to boom, you have an experience and now that's deeply felt in the core of their being that it is a part of the greater reality. Mm -hmm. And to integrate that, and can you imagine trying to explain that to people, you know, while you're recovering from what nearly killed you? I mean, it's difficult. So to, it, it, to integrate an experience like that commonly can take years. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time for them to think of it. I mean, normally, it's normal to say this couldn't have happened. How could it have not? What was happened? But, but, but as time goes on, the vividness of the memory remains far more so than memories that occurred around that time. They realized it was a special type of consciousness where the memory is retained at a much higher level than other earthly events. And as time goes on, they, they start to realize, well, that, that is real, that those were some important messages. And then the hard part, change. So even after you get the, all that information, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change to be a better person. Then is the hard stuff, the work of integrating that, becoming a more loving person, becoming uh, perhaps leaving unloving relationships. That's hard. And, and growing into, with their newfound belief, decreased materialism, uh, increased belief in an afterlife, and uh, increased awareness of, of the importance of love, not only in their love, in their life, but, but for all of humanity. And that just takes time.
In terms of uh, people I've dealt with, the issue, I think, was habits. They, they return to their old habits. And, for example, people who are in business uh, have, I think it's normal for people in business to fudge things here and there for their own personal advantage uh, in small ways, typically, as maybe for some people in big ways. But, but the average business person, I think, is accustomed to taking advantage in small ways whenever they can. And uh, that uh, is not necessarily an easy habit to break, especially when uh, everyone in your environment is doing the same thing. You are absolutely right on on that. I mean, just put yourselves in their in, in their position of a near-death experience. They understand the profound importance of love, of, of not taking advantage of other people. And they, they understand that that's not part of the greater reality. And so here they are. They've made a comfortable living. That's their identity. This is their vocation. Other people recognize, like, oh, hey, you're the businessman. That's, that's part of who they are and very deeply. So to let go of all that and to go to a different vocation to, you know, if you will, start over to carry those newfound beliefs and move forward with your life in a different direction, that's difficult. That's work. People wonder what's going on. Uh, you know, you often when you change vocations following a near-death experience, you're going to get paid less. And so that makes, may make the family unhappy because they didn't have a near-death experience and they, they may not share those values. So it's a huge adjustment. And my hat's off to the near-death experiencers that have heroically, successfully made that change, uh, expressed those values of, of love and compassion at a level that they never knew before or people around them. Uh, we're not aware of them expressing before, and they uh, simply live their life uh, better people. And then ultimately, in spite of the great changes in the long run, I'm confident the great majority of them are, are much happier than they were before their near-death experience. Uh, another issue, I gather, has to do with divorce. Mm -hmm. A fairly significant percentage of people following a near-death experience as they incorporate the the importance of loving relationships. If they're in an unloving relationship, an abusive relationship, they are much more likely to get out of it. And it's not just the understanding of the importance of love in their life. I think the near-death experience gives them the courage, the awareness that there's a bigger picture, there's a, a, a bigger thing to think about, reduce their fear of death, reduce their fear in other ways of living their earthly life such that they can get out of these unloving relationships, and they feel that it's important enough for them to seek a loving relationship, I think the great majority of them find them. Again, part of that change in their life that while it's a lot of transition, a lot of work, ultimately at the end of the day, the years later, they're going to end up being happier, better relationships, uh, happier, more loving relationships, more positive relationships, and, and hopefully in a vocation where they can express these very important values of compassion and love. How about the skeptics? I know in your community, the medical community, there are many people who are trying to uh, explain the near-death experience in conventional mechanistic terms. Ever since near-death experience was first described by Dr. Raymond Moody in 1975, we have had skeptics. Just about every conceivable physiological, cultural, psychological explanation have been brought up by skeptics to try to explain this phenomenon of near-death experience. At the current time, there are well over 20 skeptical explanations floating around. Now, the reason there's so many is very simple. Even among the skeptics themselves, they cannot, as a group, come up with any one or several of their own skeptical explanations that explain any part of near-death experience, let alone the totality of all that is observed in a near-death experience. So that's why there's so many different skeptical explanations. It's like the skeptics are saying, yeah, my, my explanation is right, and you other 19 are wrong. I mean, sheesh, give me a break. So that's why you keep having new explanations every year or two, because nothing that they're coming up with explains any part of a near-death experience, and let alone this totality of all the evidence Skeptics can't even come close to explaining it. I know that in the popular media, you usually see these articles saying, finally, science now has the answer. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that's, the, you know, sadly, in this uh, commercial, economically oriented society we're in, if somebody even does rat research and found they had a little burst of electrical activity after they thought they should have died, uh, that, and, and maybe this has something to do with near-death experience, 
the media will glamorize that as, as exactly like you're saying, gee, we found the explanation for near-death experience, here it is. And it's only when cooler minds look at the uh, skeptical explanation, we're up to 21, 22, 23, so the list goes on. So it's only after you look at that that you realize that doesn't really have anything to do with near-death experience. You, it is absolutely impossible to explain near-death experience by any function of the physical brain given the fact that they occur when the heart stopped beating, when there is no electrical activity in the brain. When you have normal, typical near-death experiences, which I found in my research time scores, when they're under general anesthesia and their heart stops, which is of course very carefully monitored under general anesthesia, there is no possible explanation for physical brain function or creating near-death experiences under the, just with those two lines of evidence out of many other lines of evidence I have. Now, another area that intrigues me quite a bit, uh, it's related to the near-death experience, at least slightly, which is psychedelic yeah. experience. Uh, do you have any opinion about that? Or have you surveyed psychedelic users to see if, if there are similarities? Uh, yes, I am been very aware of the more recent buzz in the media and other sources, and, the, and, and some, to some extent the scholarly literature, about the possibility that psychedelic medications reproduce some aspects or perhaps even all of what's observed in a near-death experience. So here's my response to that. There is a website where people f share their first-hand experiences with an unbelievable array of psychotropic or brain-acting drugs. That website is erowid.org, E-R-O-W-I-D.org. If you go there, you can look up pretty much any psychedelic substance you want. The most common one in the media these days is DMT. So if you go there, you will, as I have, you will literally find hundreds and hundreds of people sharing their DMT experiences. I would encourage anybody that wants to really know the truth about DMT and its relation to near-death experience, please go to that website. Please do exactly what I did. Go to that listing of first-person DMT experiences. And you know what? You don't even have to read more than 10. But you, will, if you want to really dig into it, read 20, read 30. But I, even after 10, you will, as I've noticed, see there's dramatically difference in DMT experiences as there are near-death experiences. I mean, on my website, these are people sharing their first-hand near-death experiences in their own language, in their own way. Exactly the same thing on arrowid.org. These are people sharing their DMT and other psychedelic experiences exactly in their words. They have no incentive to embellish or falsify it. They're posted anonymously. And yet, very quickly, you can see the dramatic difference in DMT. It's almost like an urban legend where people believe that DMT can reproduce a lot of, uh, or even most of, of what's observed in near-death experience. And I don't want to minimize some of the scholarly work being done with DMT, such as, you know, patients in hospice, that, that uh, DMT may be used appropriately, non-abusively, legally, in a way that may create some positive emotional effects, uh, may create some possible experiences that will help ease people into their afterlife as, as they're approaching death on hospice. But that is radically different from DNT or any other psychedelic drug that's taken as an abuse. What would be some of the significant distinctions yeah. between the two? Yeah, again, as you, if you go to the arrowid.org, you'll see what I've observed and what's actually been well, well described. And that is certainly the psychotropic experiences are much more likely to be frightening. Mm -hmm. um, they're much more likely to skip around like dreams. They're much more likely to be literally hallucinatory. That means they're aware of unreal events. They, uh, they may, you know, see things, hear things, smell things that are simply not real. And of course, that can be frightening to them. And so no wonder that they're much more likely to be frightening. So you see that over and over. It's just the, the gripping reality of near-death experiences flowing typically very consistently and logically step by step by step mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in an order versus the uh, psychotropic drug experiences. Uh, very, very different in so many different ways. I mean, it's literally, medically speaking, it's, it's recreating a hallucination, which by its very definition is unreal. But above and beyond that, we ask in our survey of near-death experiencers a critical question. Has anything in your life reproduced any part of the near-death experience? We ask it very open-ended like that so that if anybody's encountered anything, including psychotropic drugs, 
they're going to expect to say, yes, yeah, here it is. Mm -hmm. And it is vanishingly rare that anybody feels that any psychotropic drug that they've used or any illicit drug uh, for any purpose reproduced any aspect of the near-death experience. About the only time we see a consistent yes to that question are people, that very uncommon group, that had a second near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And then why yes, that's similar to the, the first one they're describing, but both through actual first-person uh, psychotropic psychedelic drug accounts and through that key survey question on our website times now thousands that have responded to it, uh, I am absolutely convinced that psychedelic drugs and any psychotropic drug, especially of abuse, can't consistently reproduce any aspect of near-death experience, let alone the totality of the experience. I have interviewed a Buddhist meditator who is also a psychological researcher who tells me that Advanced Buddhist meditators can enter into a state of consciousness, which according to the uh, Grayson scale for near-death experience is almost identical. Have you looked into that at all? Well, Jeffrey, matter of fact, I have. We, we keep talking about near-death experience, but I actually have two other websites, one devoted to after-death communication, the other devoted to out-of-body experiences and related experiences. Mm -hmm. And we actually encourage the submission of meditation or prayer experiences. Mm -hmm. So just exactly like the Buddhist monk you know, we are, uh, both me and my wife Jody, who's instrumental in getting keeping this going here, we're in awe at the overlap in the content that can happen in these occasional meditation or prayer experiences, some of them un uncommonly, but certainly from time to time, absolutely identical in the content of near-death experiences. That brings up a very important point. Near-death experiences, I believe, are part of a spectrum of spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, you have a near-death experience and that's the only way to have that kind of insight or experience. We see that in meditation. We see that in deathbed visions. We see that in uh, even people that are around the dying that may actually share the experiencing the deceased, their initial uh, transition into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that occasionally, certainly in spontaneous out-of-body experiences. So over and over, we're seeing very similar types of experiences. Uh, you don't really have to, to die to have a near-death experience necessarily, but you know, in the, the occasional experience like that, there, there certainly does point to human consciousness uh, expressing itself in an unearthly manner like near-death experience potentially under a lot of other circumstances. Uh, I would think mystical experiences would also uh, be quite similar. There's a very nice scholarly literature on mystical experiences, and, and I, I love reading them, uh, Jeffrey, because over and over you see the same kind of phenomena that we see in near-death experiences. I mean, gosh, if I had a nickel for every mystical experience that said, yeah, I felt that sense of unity or oneness of all and connection. I had that sense of overwhelming love uh, that transcends anything I was ever aware of or, you know, just realization of a, of a greater realm of dimensionsness, a, a, you know, uniqueness of consciousness. I mean, absolutely. The mystical experiences very much inform uh, and and are part of uh, near the, the, what we can learn with near death experiences, and once again, all part of that spectrum of experiences, all of which, uh, from interestingly, from multiple multiple sources, all converging on the obvious conclusion that our consciousness is far more than just our physical brain. I guess it would be fair to say that from your point of view, the near-death experience, the mystical experience, are pointing us towards a, a greater reality. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Uh, it's just amazing to me as I see these experiences from so many different sources, from so many pre-existing events, again, from people all around the world with, with a huge variety of, of prior belief systems. And yet, when it comes to that time that they, they transcend their earthly consciousness and, and enter the realm of the mystical, over and over there it is again, that awareness of an afterlife, a wonderful afterlife, not anything to be afraid of, but simply something that is uh, beyond earthly consciousness, that uh, realm where uh, communication is telepathic, that realm where all the miseries and anxieties we have on earth cannot, do not exist. Uh, that sense of profound love, that sense of, of profound connection, unity with all of us. Uh, it, it's really 
extremely impressive to me and actually helps, I think, in a, in a very significant way, validate what we're seeing in near-death experiences because it's not unique and I wouldn't want it to be either. The consciousness that we have, the, the evidence that it can transcend functioning of our physical brain is found in many, many different lines of evidence. And it's just a never-ending amazement and, frankly, a joy to me to see all those lines of evidence converging down to that reality we're much more in terms of consciousness than what we ever thought in our daily functioning physical brain. And it's uh, uh, much more dramatic, much accelerated. Uh, it, it, it's, um, it's not diminished, but our real consciousness, and certainly in, in near-death experiences and other mystical experiences, it's actually an accelerated type of consciousness. Do you have a feeling for where this research is leading? How is it impacting our culture? That's a great question. Now more and more people are becoming aware of near-death experiences and accepting them. Mystical experiences, people now more than ever, I believe, have the courage to share them because they're sometimes called NDE-like experiences, but they're really mystical. They're all, you know, labels don't count. What really matters is what happened. They had that first-person experience that is shared by so many people and so many different types of experiences, spiritual for lack of a better word. In other words, they're aware of that that afterlife, that acceleration of consciousness. Uh, they may be aware of a mystical, unearthly light. They may be uh, vividly aware themselves through their own personal experience that their consciousness has transcended the limitations of their physical brain. And so I think as more and more people are willing to share that, more and more investigators uh, go out and do the research and look at that spectrum of the type of conscious experiences, I think as time goes on, we may be at a threshold in society where that body of research is going to be even more convincing than we have now. Uh, more and more people accepting it. I'm hoping we're going to see more and more researchers, especially young researchers, starting out their career and having that research encouraged uh, so they can continue to share these remarkable findings with, with the rest of the world. It sounds like you're suggesting our society as a whole could be in the process of becoming more spiritualized. I think there's no question about that. I think the powerful impact of people being aware of near-death experiences and other experiences, I think at a significant level is impacting huge numbers of people throughout society to understand there really is an afterlife. Uh, there is an end to our earthly misery. There is a consciousness that survives. It's who they are, everything that they are, and more with consciousness accelerated in a wonderful afterlife that is for everybody. There's no stepchildren in the afterlife. We're all a part of the one. We're all a part of that which is connected in the afterlife. So I think as much of this research is getting out through scholarly research, the publications and media presentations and increased openness of people, regardless of their pre-existing belief systems, I think this is really helping in a very important way, helping people to understand that who we are, who we think we are, is far beyond the physical brain, and that consciousness is the cornerstone. Dr. Jeffrey Long, this has been a delightful conversation. It's so exciting for me to be able to share your passion for this work with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for the opportunity. Jeffrey, fantastic interview. This was great. Thanks again. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.